So I'm speaking with uh, Emmy-winning composer Sean Callery, who's composed uh, the scores for long-running shows like 24, Bones, Medium, uh, La Femme Nikita. This year he's up for his 12th uh, nomination for his main theme to the hit series Homeland, which premieres on September 30th, its second season. Thanks uh, so much for talking with me today. It is a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me. Um, so to, to start off, uh, I was wondering, how did you get into music, and how did it lead to, to film and TV scoring? You know, I, my first, uh, I, I was a pianist when I was a young kid. I started playing piano, I guess, when I was in first grade in Rhode Island. And I was, you know, a classical pianist. Uh, but I loved, um, I don't know what it was. And my mother took me when I was very young. I don't know why she did this. It was like first or second grade. She took me to see 2001 A Space Odyssey on a school night. I guess she really wanted to see the Stanley Kubrick. I guess she was a big fan of Kubrick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember well, that. And that, that score was full of classical music and Ligeti and so forth. But I just was, I, it was really an amazing experience, even as a young kid. It was a very terrifying movie, too. Uh, but I just I just had this connection to film music, and then when Jaws came out a few years later, I was in my early teens, and uh, I just, I, I you know, the, the infamous two-note motif theme aside, there was so much swashbuckling adventure music in it, uh, I just I don't know what it was. I just I just felt such a connection to the music behind uh, the movies, and so I sort of at that time began working as a sort of a cocktail jazz pianist, where I would do renderings and arrangements of songs from movies and stuff. So like from around 15, I started working in little restaurants, and then I went off to New England Conservatory uh, in 80, 1982, and then I from there I just continued my education and was uh, hoping to go to composition school, and then I moved to Los Angeles for a job with a computer music company, and it was through there that I uh, met a couple of major composers, just helping them out, technically, mm -hmm. technical issues, uh, one of which was Mark Snow, who was the composer of the great series The X-Files, right, right. and he and, he and I, became, uh, I became professional acquaintances with him, and then over time, we became really, really wonderful friends, and he, he helped me get my first job. I know it's kind of a long answer to your question, but <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but that's that's the, that's the Cliff Notes version of, uh, of how it happened. But it's, it was about making relationships and and uh, certainly uh, having a, a, a profound amount of luck. Right. You know? uh, I'm always interested in hearing everyone's you know own, own path because everyone's path is, is always different. Isn't it? Yeah, it's and, crazy. So now you're... Um, I mean, you've composed a lot of television series and films. Um, right now, you're kind of juggling Homeland and uh, and Bones uh, that you're currently right. working on. Uh, are you ever juggling those two shows at the same time, or are they set up where you work on one and then the next one starts production? I've, I've been very lucky in one regard with the projects that I've worked on in that um, it, it, it's almost, the metaphor is almost like when you have uh, kids, you know, uh, when you have a very young series, when you have a new series, like mm -hmm. when 24 first started, Nikita was ending. And uh, often in the first, in the formative years of a series, you're finding the sound, the color, the, the essence of it, really, working with the producers. It's a very exciting, fertile time uh, of creativity. And I've never had the problem of having two sort of brand new projects starting simultaneously. I don't think that, for me, I could... Um, bring a complete, you know, bring the right attention uh, to both projects in terms of what they would need exactly at that time. So I, I'm happy to say that, first of all, the, the production schedules are, are somewhat staggered, so they never really overlap in a bad way. And, and the other advantage is that, you know, Bones is a much more mature series, mm -hmm. and, and Homeland is, is it's a, uh, Homeland is just a wonderful, wonderful series, and it's also only 13 episodes as opposed to a full 22. So it... Uh, you know, the universe kind of opens up, thankfully, sometimes in our favor, and we get to go to sleep on weekends, you know, <laughs> case, occasionally, right. not much, but we try, you know. And you meant, yeah, you mentioned the episode length, um, you know, episode, the episode count for broadcast network shows, you know, are, are much higher than cable. Do you find it more challenging to compose music for a show like Bones or 24 versus something more concise like Homeland? Uh, you know, it's, it's a great question, because 
uh, with 24, you had 24 episodes in a right, season. Right, right, right. And that, and that literally is 14 more days of time that you need to kind of squeeze into to a, to a season. You think, well, what's 14 days out of a year? But it really, you know, when you talk about deliveries and air dates and stuff, it's, it's not, it, it really, you really run out of runway in terms of your schedule. Um, interestingly enough, you know, in the, in shows like Homeland, you know, there's, there's no commercials. So it, it, these are, uh, and with 24, you had four or five act breaks sometimes. Right, right. So the, the, the very spotting of a show is very affected by, by, by the insertion of commercials. You have music that often takes you to an act out or something like that, very abrupt ending sometimes and so on. None of those kinds of situations present themselves in Homeland. Uh, which is great because it, it it's a it's a different kind of narrative. It's a different kind of uh, uh, spotting process for the music. You know, things tend tend to be able to breathe a bit more. Mm-hmm. And uh, I find that Homeland, you know, has a relatively compared to 24, a lower minute count of score to compose for. But <laughs> but it, it it it's a it's a score that requires a, a tremendous amount of precision with. Uh, with the, the creatives that I answer to and so forth, so it's it, it's a it's a delight to work on, but it it, it certainly it, it takes it actually takes as long as it, or or if not a, a bit longer to compose for that series as opposed to a show like Twenty Four, which which had you know much more music, but it took just about the same amount of time to do. Wow, that's and it's crazy, but yeah, it's, yeah. I, I I can't put a finger on why that's true, but it just it just is. So you know when you're so when you're getting uh, ready to start a season, uh, do you like to work in the moment, one episode at a time, or do you try to keep the entire season uh, in focus as one massive arc? You know, I used to read uh, what I what I what I do right now is I read two or three scripts at the very beginning of a of a show, at the mm-hmm. very beginning of a season, and then I that's and then from there, before I've even seen any of the picture, I just start thinking about what I reacted to when I read the story, you know, when I read the script. And I'll begin to start jotting down and writing down some ideas, you know, maybe even composing some things without even having seen anything, just some colors, just anything that sort of intuitively uh, pops up, you know, Mm -hmm. from reading. And then when the picture comes, um, I sort of see how that journey of exploring without the picture marries to... When, it, when the rubber meets the road of the, of the final picture cut. And uh, sometimes there's some delightful surprises, and sometimes, you know, you, you saw things that ended up sort of feeling and, being ex- and, and get executed a different way. So I try to do that. I, tr- I try not to find out, honestly, too much about the future plot of, of Homeland. As a matter of fact, I just finished watching the third episode of the season, uh, spotting it, and I love being... A viewer, you know, I love being a fan of the show, and and when you're watching it, you know, when you're sorry, it's hard to articulate <laughs> this stuff. I apologize. You know, you you be, you can be a fan of the show exactly once. In other words, you're a viewer just like everyone else when you watch it. Right. And I pay very close attention to what I feel and react to emotionally when I'm when I'm doing that because in and of itself, an emotion or a feeling that you have spontaneously is inherently, there's nothing wrong about it. It's, it, it is what it is. And so I try to honor whatever comes up for me uh, in that experience of viewing. And then when I go back to the analytical compositional process, I really try to honor what, was, what, comes up, what came up for me emotionally and what the intent and the meaning of, of things were in the scenes and the sections that I saw that, that you know these impulses arose from. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, how much music does usually, like on average, an episode contain for Homeland? I think the largest episode was 24, 25 minutes, and the least amount of, of score was in the vicinity of seven or eight minutes. And and how long? Yeah, do you, how, how long do you usually have for for one episode? You know, it really varies. Uh, we have sometimes spotted two shows at once, and they'll mix the following week two days apart. Hmm. You know, so you'll you can have you, you hope to have at least four days of true just compositional time. Uh, that sometimes happens. That sometimes doesn't. And um, you just you just you just 
keep you just stay on the train. You know, right. hold on. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, and you're, you're on on Homeland, you're, you're working with uh, co-developers and executive producers Howard Gordon and Alex Gonza, who you worked with on Twenty Four on your time there mm-hmm. as well. Um, how has your relationship, uh, you know, grown over the course of Twenty Four and into uh, Homeland? Uh, how is your working relationship, and how do you guys communicate with each other? Well. I'm not just saying this. I really couldn't ask for a better group of people to work with. I mean, these guys, they care about creating good product. They are courteous and respectful to all creative ideas. They, over the years with Howard, you might say we develop a shorthand of certain things, mm-hmm. you know, uh, just because we know each other, which is great. Uh, it's it's really wonderful to have sort of a... a there's the fluidity of having a very professional relationship when we're playing back a score and discussing the nuances of how something's working. And then the social aspect of just, just the fact that I think that they're great human beings. And, uh, I, as a matter of fact, Howard's son is in music and he was home for the summer from college. And I hired the, I hired uh, his son to, uh, do some archiving for me here in the studio, just to archive, uh, the scores from Homeland because, you know, when you're working sometimes during the season, it, it's sort of like a spaghetti. It's sort of like a a kitchen that just exploded. You know, mm-hmm. after a meal yeah. for 25 people, and <laughs> I had to sort of revert, I had to go back and look at everything that happened in uh, season one and sort of correlate and organize it. And he he was a great help with that. But the relationships with these gentlemen are are just great. It, I, I love the. What's most important is the. Um, it's just the fact that there's just great communication, and I have such respect for their creative process and uh, in the end we're all aligned with the idea that we just want to create a great great entertainment right and and we've been really i mean i've been very lucky to be associated with a show like 24 which when it was when we first looked at it in 2001 you know with all these multi screens and stuff you know you just didn't you didn't know what it was going to be you didn't know how it was going to turn out and then with homeland another just a just a, a masterpiece of storytelling as far as, as in my opinion mm-hmm. so and so how how important is the level of trust between the showrunners and the composer on a series? And have you ever dealt with, you know, kind of an overbearing or over-controlling showrunner in the past? And has that, does that inhibit, you know, your creativity at all? Uh, I think most, I'm trying to just think of any showrunner that I had a, any, I didn't, I don't think I, knock wood now, I don't think I've had any <laughs> real obstacle with, with showrunners. I, you know, I find that showrunners, generally set the entire tone of the show they 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 if uh if uh the showrunner on on bones uh which is Stephen nathan and hart hansen these guys are these guys are such they, they they they're writers and they're also great exec producers and they have such a sense of humor and that sense of humor is evident everywhere in the production process mm-hmm. you know and and you so appreciate that and it 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 makes everyone working for them that much more into doing their best. You know, it, there's an encouragement to play. There's an encouragement to explore. The best showrunners are the people that encourage the people that they've hired to spread out and explore and do what they do best. Uh, if if a, if a showrunner is particularly stressed out in a, in a particular week, which is certainly uh, part of their gig because they have to answer to situations that I have no clue about mm-hmm. even there when you have a intelligent and and appreciative showrunner you're still the, the mood is still good it's still it can still work I I've never thankfully I, I don't think I've ever been on a show where the showrunner was an obstacle to the creative process in a, in, in, in a way where it made it you know untenable mm-hmm and again, I knock wood as I say that. Right. <laughs> and I've, I've, because I have talked to compo- composers, um, I'm not going to name any names or anything, but they've talked about how, and you, you watch an episode and you see source music in there, and I would talk to them about that, and they go, yeah, sometimes they they just don't use what I give them and stuff like that. So I know that in some situations it can be kind of, you know, you know, you have the creative differences, I guess. But I, I, Well, listen, I mean, in in the I find that, when you're launching a series or launching anything new, mm-hmm. you have there are different levels of creative input. 
uh, in the case of any show, you would have the primary showrunners slash executive producers. Right. Then you have the studio that's overseeing and approving this content. And then you have the network, which ultimately is the one buying it. Mm -hmm. It could be three separate creative entities. I did have a, an experience on a project where there were profound, profoundly different views on how a certain project should sound. And I was getting two sets of instructions from two different decision makers. Right. And it made it... We, the thing that every one of them had in common is that they want to make a great show. So you, 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 you look at the similarities that you have, but but sometimes people have profoundly different views as to how you get to that, get over the end zone there, get into right, the end right. zone. So, so what happens, uh, you know, what has happened is sometimes when I, when someone says go this way and then I go that way and then someone looks at it and says, no, we want it this way, you know, I'll try to marry or synthesize out or distill out the essence of what these requests are so that you might find a common ground uh, without sacrificing the aesthetic of, of the music that you want to, put and compose for the for this moment mm -hmm. if, if i have had circumstances where in the end I, I have invited all people including the heads of studios uh to to my studio to sit down and 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 let's duke it out here let's play back everything and and have because i it's at some point you need someone to say this is how we're going to go this is the, this is where we this is where i want to be going right. and this is where I want the composer to be going and sometimes as a composer you do I think it's fair to say we do sometimes need some clarity uh, in terms of vision if, if I think the most accomplished composer in the galaxy would find his life force perpetually dwindling if you just kept composing and composing and composing and you just kept, you just kept getting told no not that go here, go here, go here, because you're putting so much of yourself into everything that you're trying to do. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it can, it can deplete the resources of the most strong-willed person. Uh, so anyway, it's a probably long-winded answer to your question, but, <laughs> no. but they do. But sometimes, sometimes we do do good. Sometimes it is duped out with everybody in the same room, and that's the wonderful part of having human beings in the same room at the same time is that you can get <laughs> yeah. it right on the table. Right. Rather than a series of emails with, uh, you know, yeah, never ending. That, yeah. Oh, <laughs> good lord! I mean, I love. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of technology, but sometimes the the, the most progress will happen with five, six people in one room talking about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the endless loops of emails or just go nowhere. <laughs> oh, it goes on and on. Um, so after such an impressive season one with Homeland. What are your goals musically for season two? To be perfectly straight with you, I'm still figuring that out. I have, <laughs> I do know some certain new colors that are coming into the storyline that that I have that I'm that I'm forming in the first. I finished the first two episodes, mm -hmm. and they're just great episodes. I mean, I, I I wish part of me wishes we could be talking about the episodes now, but we won't be able to do that for another month and a half. But, right, right. But they are. Um, it's just it's the show that everyone remembered and and it's up a notch in my opinion it's not it doesn't do any gimmicks or tricks it's just straight ahead storytelling the thing about homeland from the point of view of the score uh is we never wanted to score any scene that told the audience how to feel mm -hmm. as have you watched the series um i've i i'm have not, but my friend has it because I don't have Showtime, so I'm yep. I'm waiting for the, the the set to come out in August. So, well, without giving anything away, because there's probably people might be hearing this that, that haven't seen the show yet. There there are some central mysteries about the first season uh, that require one person that require you as a viewer to say, hmm, I wonder if this person is going in this direction or that direction. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it was amazing how sometimes you would score a scene or place music in a way that sort of tilted the energy towards a conclusion that, oh, obviously that means this person is bad. Or you scored it in a way that implied that everything was okay or that this was a, a warm, loving situation. It, it, it was 
we always set out to sort of uh, score the the I don't knowness of it, if you get my drift, the, con- the, the the sort of duplicity of of how certain things play out, where you just don't know right. what the right. intentions of certain people uh, are, or what the what the what what the meaning of certain situations are, and that that sort of uncertainty, that unanswered question, that sort of gets returned to the viewer, I think was what made the show compelling. Is it doesn't answer things that we deep down yes please tell me the answer tell me the answer I want to know but a lot of times as a viewer you don't want to know right you, know, you love you love that that being suspended and 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 wrestling with the questions and stuff so to wrap things up I always like to ask composers uh, this question uh, if you had the chance to score any movie ever made with no disrespect to the original composer which movie would you choose oh, oh that's a that's a that's a that's a question, man. I'm trying to. <laughs> that's the question. I think I want to choose it. You know, I'll, I'll say the birds because I didn't have any score in it. Ooh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a safe enough answer, right? Because honestly, it, uh, I can't think of a. I can't think of any score. You know, my favorite scores. You know, the ones I that I always always hear over and over again. I I wouldn't want to touch them. You know. So and, and yes, with all due respect, but uh, I I couldn't. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> what are the answers that some composers have said? I've just I, what have they said? Um, let's see. Elliot Goldenthal said uh, Giant. Um, I just talked to Jeff Zanelli. He'd like to do uh, Willy Wonka. Um, oh wow! Okay, well that's that's cool. So it's I mean, it's just like a you know what playground would you like to play in? You know not. To, yeah, not, I hear you. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, you know what? You know what would be kind of fun is uh, when I was a kid. I loved the Pink Panther movies. Ooh, you know good they one. were yeah. and, and Henry Mancini. You know. I will never ever write a, a theme to top the Pink Panther is, for, the, for that film. That's for that's for sure. But I can imagine that would have been a fun thing to score. And and I would put one caveat: I'd like to score it as a thirteen-year-old because I just couldn't stop watching Peter Sellers. So. <laughs> that's a great answer. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, this, you know. Well, thank you. This has been a pleasure, and I hope I haven't bored your audience to tears. And I appreciate <laughs> no, no. It was... your time. Great chatting with you too, Sean, and uh, good luck uh, next month at the Emmys. And uh, thanks, man. And good luck with you know the new season as you power through it. And uh, hopefully we get to do it sometime and do this again sometime in the future. So thanks. That so much. would be that would be fun. And uh, I I was thinking right as we end here, the um, you know you would ask me a questions about about showrunners. Right. Uh, I had I I don't know if this will be of interest to you in your. Uh, I will say that with regards to Homeland, uh, you know, we had a, in Homeland, there was a, a, a feeling early on that we wanted to explore having a jazz language in the score. Mm-hmm. And that was not a universally held idea. And that had to be sold, really. You had to, you had to work it and, and, and with regards to the main title and so forth, right. we had to really be vigilant and dedicated to selling that vision for the series. And sometimes you encountered conflicting opinions from other creatives and you had to work together to sort of distill out the the best possible outcome. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm happy to say that in the end that jazz language does manifest itself to a certain extent in the series and I think that's part of that's a nice special flavor for this for this series. Yeah, it's just hard sometimes to convince people I guess to go the the untraveled route, you know, when it hasn't been done before. It is, and then it is hard to do that and then and then once it happens and it gets well received, then it's like, well, of course, we then, wanted it all along, you yeah. know. <laughs> and then you then you hear it pop up in other shows and other people do it, yeah. <laughs> well, that would be a compliment, but no, I, you know, all of that aside, it was just in the end. I, I do think that the, I do think that the conflict that arises, while unpleasant, I mean, you, you'd like to have a. It'd be great if there was no, you know, no kinds of conflicts, but the conflicts are very healthy because they help people refine their points of view. And if people are open, they take in other points of view, and then together, uh, the, the, 
the project becomes that much better. Mm-hmm. Just and kinda, so, yeah. so, so it was. It was that I can say that with the, in the case of Homeland, that most certainly happened, and 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 to the and to the benefit of the series, which is great. Well, that's good to hear. It's, I yeah. mean, like healthy, healthy argument. Healthy arguing is always good. I think just so because if you just have a one-sided view on things, it's gonna, you know, sometimes you need somebody to challenge yourself and be like, no, this is better. Which I've, you know, encountered working on productions and stuff of my own. Like, well, this would. I'm like, yeah, okay, that actually does. You know, you you step back and go, yeah, that other person was right. You know, <laughs> that's very true. And and you, when I when I worked on Medium. Mm-hmm. the TV show for Medium, the exec producer, Glenn Karen was uh, just one of the most brilliant uh, executive producers I've ever had the privilege of working with. And when I sat down to spot with him, he knew exactly how each episode, the tone of he knew how he wanted the tone of each episode to be executed. So there, there are times when someone is so certain in their vision that there's, there's no, there's no need for, kicking it around right. because someone has already truly manifested what they want and what they envision the show to be. And if the showrunner really has that kind of clarity, even if you agree or don't agree, it, it is, the, the clarity of it is very uh, easy going on the composer. That makes it very easy going on the composer. Right. I guess it would be more focused, I guess, for you, because I, I, every time I talk to composers, I say, I, when I talk about directors and they, and I say, what's a, a tr- uh, and a tribute that you would not want in a, in a director, and they say indecisiveness. They, they oh, that is the, that is the truth. Mm-hmm. That is the truth. When they don't know what they want, and they're like, I don't know. I, I had a composer friend once say that a director said, you know, I'm the kind of director that wants you to write four or five versions of a scene, four or five cues. You know, <laughs> I just want to be able to decide. And, and I, that just, that when I hear a sentence like that, that just, it, 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 it makes me physically weak, the right. idea that you would have to, take you know your initial point of view and i'm not saying that composers don't get inspired to write alternates or options as in terms of other choices that they might feel might work for the scene but this sounded like he was basically saying i want you to be a full-time music editor slash supervisor writing original music four or five six levels deep so we can just sort of mix and match six levels of stems and it sounds it sound it sounded grisly. I know that's when you turn it back on him and say, "Why don't you shoot five or six versions of every scene?" <laughs> <laughs> well, if I have the uh, if I ever get the balls to be able to pull that off, that would be uh, that would that would be that would be time for our next interview because I'll tell you exactly what, what what's said after that sentence. <laughs> Unless you're Terrence Malick, and then you do that automatically. But <laughs> I. <laughs> Oh man! And then make well, it a, make it a we, nightmare we, for the editors. <laughs> oh my goodness! My goodness! 